there everybody, it's Mark Crilly. I'm back with another How to Draw video. And when I say I'm back, I do mean I am back. I just got back from Japan, uh, where I was last week with my family, visiting uh, my wife's parents and uh, uh, friends and so forth. And uh, while I was there, I picked up the one and only Bananya. That's right, yes. Earlier this week, Monday it was, I released a video showing 16 weird and wonderful things that I encountered while I was in Japan. I'll put a, an annotation link, I'll put a link in the info box so that you can find out more about Bananya and how I got hold of it. Uh, but uh, otherwise, let's go ahead and get on with this video. I'm going to be talking about how to draw hair today. It's been a while since I covered this uh, topic, and so what I did is I got the basic guidelines in place for uh, uh, head and neck shoulders of a character that I'll be drawing. Uh, and uh, I'm going to go ahead and use time lapse again. That's right, old man time lapse is back from his vacation. I'm back! Did you miss me? Uh, and we're going to be uh, doing a little bit of time lapse. Just get the eyes, the nose, the mouth, uh, and so forth into place. And uh, then I'll be back to talk about my plans for drawing the hair. All right, so we've got the eyes and the nose and the mouth in place, and uh, sorry that I uh, am skipping through all that, but I do need this video to focus entirely on the hair, and so that's why I'm just sort of getting that part out of the way. And uh, I am going to use time lapse one more time, at least. Uh, I think I'm entitled to. I went four weeks without using any time lapse. So anyway, I'm going to use a little time lapse to get the basic guidelines in place uh, for the hair, but after that we're going to get into some real-time drawing. All right, so we've got some uh, basic guidelines in place here for the hair, and uh, the first thing you might notice is how full-bodied this hair is. Um, I mean, if you think about the fact that her eyes are pretty low on her face to begin with, uh, and that we, you know, really must imagine her scalp being somewhere around here. I find that the uh, certain Japanese uh, artists, anyway, manga artists, are giving their characters extremely full-bodied hair, which I do believe... Um, uh, of course, calls attention to the hair, makes uh, the hair more prominent in the illustration, but also serves to make the character look more youthful um, by, uh, again, having these facial features seem quite low compared to the rest of the head. Well, uh, let's go ahead and start getting into um, uh, adding detail and uh, figuring out where the various strands of hair will be. And one of the first ways of um, uh, doing that is to uh, decide to have a part. Um, and uh, you can see it here. I already put into place a kind of uh, an indication of lines here where the hair is um, you know really growing out of the top of the head and uh, this helps organize things and then I added in a sort of a part here uh, what will end up being a pretty loose part in fact I'll go ahead and add some additional strands here so as to not make it quite so you know uh, bold and clear uh, separating one part of her hair to the other but it is helpful to have a sense of, um, of uh, have like a game plan of where you're headed with this. And so that now that I've decided, let's take this section over here, we've decided that this is where the uh, various strands of hair are flowing from. This can help me figure out where I, how I want the lines to go. So I'm going to begin separating this um, very large section into various <laughs> subsections. Those of you who know my videos, you know I love to use subsections subdivisions of subsections. Um, but the important thing is that the hair, the lines are following the direction of the scalp. Now I'm going to just jump in here and quickly erase uh, the line of the scalp itself, which is, you know, going to be completely obliterated. We're obliterating her scalp! Uh, and uh, But th this helps you get a sense of how e each line is, is flowing uh, in this um, similar but not identical direction as it begins to reach over here and then I'm going to have it kind of straighten out and begin right because this is curving in the opposite direction begin to have uh, there's sort of like a, a midpoint where it, begin, it begins to separate off in the opposite direction uh, and then um, I think what I'll do is I'll add an extra strand here which I like to do it makes the hair a little more lively looking or a little more natural looking. Uh, so yeah, let's, uh, we'll be coming back to this and adding further detail, but for now let's stop with that and, and move over to this other area on the other side of the part. Now what happens here is that again the lines begin to curve 
uh, in the in this direction that we had been using over there. Uh, and a sort of a similar thing is going to happen. We reach a point, like I've decided there's this strand, this very long strand of hair that comes down by her ears. A fairly uh, common thing that we see, not just in the anime illustrations, but actually in, you know, uh, real Japanese women sometimes you see uh, a hairstyle like this. So actually, let's go ahead and erase by her cheek here a bit. And um, so I thought what I would do is have this one long strand, again, it's all sort of coming from the top, that very top part of the head, uh, coming straight down here. And then what I really want to get into with this video is to get into a bit more detail with uh, her hair kind of interacting with her shoulder. Uh, that is to say, sort of flowing across her shoulder, um, the various strands flowing in, in different directions. And, and I do believe that will give a very naturalistic look and just sort of call attention to the, the beauty of the hair. So I'm going to go ahead and erase the rest of her scalp, obliterate. <laughs> Sounds so violent. Obliterate the remainder of her scalp. Uh, just make this line go away because it was there mainly for you know getting a sense of the structure of the head. Um, and then continue. So like I said, you know the the lines were curving in this direction. We reach a kind of a straight point, maybe right around here before it begins to gradually curve in the opposite direction. Now later on when I begin to um, go to final lines, I probably will detach this piece of paper um, from the uh, desk. I've got it taped down to the desk so as to hold it perfectly in place, but I probably will be detaching this later so as to allow um, me to come at the page from different angles uh, as I create those final lines. But here's where I want you to pay attention. Uh, to uh, this idea of the of the strands of hair interacting, uh, if that's the right word, <laughs> and it probably isn't, um, with her shoulder, I've decided. Let's see. Let's say this this strand here is sort of flowing in this direction. I thought, what if there's a second strand coming right behind her ear? I'm going to go ahead and erase her neck, and then have a second strand that's coming down like this and then flowing across her shoulder, the second strand here. Uh, and I thought what would make it even more sort of naturalistic looking is if, if the hair is not so perfect that the uh, the strands begin to sort of interlace with one another a little. So let's say there's a third strand here that kind of cuts behind and almost flows across and joins with that other one, the first one. I mean like numbering strands. Strand number one, strand number two, strand number three. Um, but you can see what I'm trying to do here, sort of interlace these different uh, strands of hair. And, um, you know, it seems maybe pretty laborious, but I think it's worth it for the final effect. So let's go to a, like a strand number four here that's coming across. And uh, that's gonna maybe, you know, it's not exactly the same as this one that really is sort of flowing right across her shoulder, but this one also flowing off in this direction, whereas this one is coming over here. I hope this is clear. Uh, and then maybe a final, uh, would that be fifth, um, or if I'm losing count, of the fifth strand back here behind uh, that one. So I don't know if I explained that in the best way possible, but uh, hopefully some of you get a sense of what I'm trying to do here. And once you've decided on these uh, various kind of core uh, strands of hair, you can um, add little stray pieces of hair, like, for example, just one single, uh, I don't know if it's a single hair, but just a small little uh, series of hairs. One might even come across like that from behind. And, uh, you know, as I add final line work to this, I think it will become more clear. I'm afraid right now it may, might be a little bit like... What are all those lines? Dude, I can't keep any of this straight. Um, let's go ahead and come over here 
and uh, I'm not going to spend too much time on this, you know, hair that's on the other side uh, of her uh, head, but I think we could do maybe one um, thing that's a little similar to what I was doing over here, and that is to say, what if one strand uh, does indeed come across and flow in the, in the opposite direction, you know, across her shoulder. And that'll give it just a bit more of a naturalistic look. Um, I'm going to get one extra strand here. Again, for the same reason that I did that before over here, just makes it a little more loose and free looking, you know. I, one thing I try to avoid with drawing hair is you don't want it to look like a, a helmet or something, you know, like it's just um, one single uniform block. I shouldn't, and as soon as I say that, I, 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 I want to step back and say, well, sometimes maybe you do want that look, but certainly not uh, in today's illustration. Well, I think it's time for me to pull out my trusty black Prismacolor and my <laughs> cat in a banana. <laughs> Just because I want to look at it again. <laughs> no, I'm going to pull out my black Prismacolor and do some of the final line work here uh, on the hair. It's basically going to be going over the lines that we have already done here. Um, and uh, you may see me add a little further detail to the eyes and so forth. Um, but the, once I've done that, I can come back and maybe get into uh, the shading, which I'd like to do um, quite a lot of it uh, in real time. So let's go ahead and do the final line work with the black Prismacolor. Alright, so I got the final line work done, and of course you saw me do uh, quite a lot of detail there in the eyes. Again, sorry this can't be a video about the eyes, but I have done quite a number of them, and I will link uh, in the info box uh, uh, if you want a, a separate video that teaches you more about the eyes, or indeed drawing the whole face. Um, but now I want to get into adding shading, and I do hope uh, to be able to do a fair amount of this um, real time. Now first, before I get into talking about the shading, though, I wanted to explain, in case some people didn't know, why did I detach the paper uh, just for that one part? Well, it's because uh, um, when you're doing final line work, inking, and so forth, um, you, you want to follow the natural pivot point of your wrist. Um, if the page is locked down, as it is right now, especially when I come over here, it's very hard. I almost want to come all the way over here so as to get the pivot point of the wrist. The easiest thing to do is have the page move around, and so, um, you know, uh, that's the way it is most of the time, isn't it? No, people are not taping down their paper. <laughs> Every time they draw, I do that mainly uh, to make sure that uh, uh, the picture is very clear in these videos. Uh, in any case, that's why um, you see me, uh, or saw me, spinning the page around so as to get that optimal uh, pivot point of the wrist uh, before I did, um, you know, pretty much each and every one of those lines. Now I'm uh, going into add shading, and uh, you see me holding this pencil, which is a Dixon Ticonderoga, um, very low to the page. I always like to stress, though, that there's no need for you to run out and buy a Dixon Ticonderoga. Uh, work with any pencil that um, you find uh, works nicely for you. I think the number one thing to pay attention to with any pencil that you get is uh, uh, how hard or soft the lead is. Uh, if the lead is super, super soft, you may find that it's smearing too easily and um, it becomes uh, a mess. Then the opposite problem is if the lead is too hard, then the, you're really struggling just to get the lead down onto the paper and all your lines end up kind of a dark gray instead of um, uh, black, or certainly not the, the full uh, super dark gray that graphite normally produces. Now what I'm doing is creating a base layer here, and some of you saw me, um, uh, you know, sort of smoothing it out with my finger. Great controversy around that topic. You should never use your finger to, <laughs> to, to smear the gravite. 
the oils of your finger are destroying everything. Uh, and the, the, I'm sure there is a case to be made for that. Um, I just, I don't know, I just, I enjoy the immediacy of um, going in there with the finger. But it is, so there are tools, blending stumps, I believe they're called, for doing super precise blending. And then, yeah, you know, I guess it um, keeps the oil of your fingers from damaging the paper. Um, but yeah, I'm creating a base layer here that uh, is pretty undifferentiated. Um, just to have something to build on top of. And making sure that all these things that are supposed to be strands of hair uh, are getting uh, at least one base layer of color to them. Uh, in this case, a sort of a gray, a uniform gray. Um, and what I'm going to be getting into in a moment is starting to deepen the shading in certain areas. Um, so as to make the hair seem more three-dimensional. Now, uh, pretty early on in this process, you want to decide what your um, light source is, what direction the light is coming from. And uh, the clue in this illustration is uh, in the eyes. You see the highlights over here that suggests that light is coming from over here. So we certainly don't want to go too dark, uh, even in the base layer, over on this uh, this side of the illustration because the light is shining on her uh, from this direction. So that, uh, as you would imagine, the where the light cannot reach is over here on the leftern side <laughs> of the illustration. Leftern. I wonder if I can get that in the dictionary. Uh, the left-hand side of the illustration is going to be uh, considerably darker. I'm using sort of circular motions right here, almost just kind of noticing this as I do. Uh, as I do it. Uh, uh, there's so many different ways of shading um, and one of the reasons that I don't tend to do too many videos about shading, well first of all the, it is a time-consuming process uh, and it's hard for the video not to end up being super super long, but the other reason is I, I'm, I believe shading is such a personal stylistic choice that uh, um, I, I want everyone to be aware that I, I don't intend to suggest this is how you ought to shade your illustrations. I, I'm a firm believer in everyone finding the way that works best for them. So that's uh, that's partly why I kind of shy away from saying here's how to shade all drawings. The Mark Rilly way, you know. No, absolutely that is not the case. Um, but, you know, sure, every once in a while I think I should cover this topic. So now I'm starting to move into um, adding a bit more darkness over here. And what I thought I would do uh, is, uh, as I was saying earlier, start to add, like, really dark areas. Um, like here, for example. If we decide that this base layer is sort of a light gray, um, I'm going to start to create pockets of a uh, secondary color, a darker gray, that is going to hopefully create fairly sharp shadows and begin to um, delineate this hair and give it more form, make it a little more three-dimensional. Um, let's go over here. I'm going to take a whole section over here and add this... Um, this sort of dark gray that I'm talking about, creating a wide uh, section. And I think over here, the far area, I'm just going to go ahead and uh, color all of that, maybe just leave, leaving a little strand of white there, just a little strand of white. And then go ahead and uh, yeah, darken all of this over here. I wanted to also point out, actually I'm going to lighten that up, because uh, I was going to point out about how, you know, you can, if you want to, you can really get into this area where the uh, the strands of hair are coming out of the top of the head, depending on the angle, uh, and, um, you know, get into the details of, of the hair coming, uh, you know, flowing out in various directions. And you can see that I certainly did a fair amount of that. And then over here, where, you know, I spent so much time earlier, I think it'll really pay off uh, a little extra attentiveness to adding the uh, dark gray in certain key areas. That's going to really help clarify what I was 
going for if it wasn't immediately clear as I talked about, you know, strand number one and strand number two, and it's like, what is he doing? <laughs> Who is this guy? Does he even know what he's talking about? Um, by adding in this, this darker area, uh, it hopefully clarifies that situation a little more and um, begins to create this effect that I really wanted to go for the, of, of, you know, hair that is, uh, I don't know if disheveled is the right word, but uh, uh, hair where the strands are not all flowing in exactly the same direction, which I think can be quite attractive in terms of an illustration. Um, certainly you see you know, even in the fashion industry or whatever, uh, photographers, rather than having the hair perfectly arranged, very often they almost um, seem to be, uh, you know, making it messy in a beautiful way, you know what I mean? Uh, so that's kind of what I wanted to go for, especially in this area down here. Notice that this section right here is sort of like a strand that's um, twisting around on itself. I don't know how long me erase away just a little bit. I'm going to try to, in fact, come back with the uh, black Prismacolor to, to sort of clarify that a little bit. Although, uh, you know, I become nervous because I can't, uh, this thing is taped down, I can't uh, get the optimal. But it's pretty straight up and down, it's not too bad. Anyway, um, hopefully you can see how this strand is sort of twisting around and we're seeing like the opposite side of it that is uh, lit by the sun. And uh, yeah, maybe we're uh, getting to a point where I probably should uh, bring in old man time lapse back fresh from his vacation. Oh, Barbados really treated me right. <laughs> but I feel rested. I'm in top form, ready to do some rip snorting time lapse in the weeks ahead. He's starting to sound more and more uh, Texan or something. What's going on? <laughs> I got to straighten out my, maybe he does hail from Texas. Old man time lapse. Anyway, I'm going to go ahead and kick it into time lapse to uh, continue adding shading, um, uh, focusing, uh, as I said, on uh, uh, on the the light source being here on the right, uh, and the, that causes all the shadows to form over here on the left. I'm going to go ahead and just keep working on this, refining things a bit more, and then we'll come back to start adding highlights. All right, well, I've finished with the shading and it's time to bring out my beloved white gouache. <laughs> Dearly beloved, we are gathered here today to apply gouache to an illustration. Uh, so I'm taking a uh, brush and applying just a, a few touches of uh, white gouache so as to uh, make the uh, hair seem uh, more shiny and um, Sometimes I see in the comments section people saying, you know, could I use uh, liquid paper uh, or correction fluid to do this? And, you know, you could try, but uh, that stuff is made for drying really quickly. It's super, super thick. Um, I think it would be very hard to achieve uh, detailed lines like this with uh, correction fluid. So. See if you can make your way to your local art store or craft uh, supply store and look for a tube of white gouache. It really is not that expensive. And uh, one, uh, one tube will last you for a very long time. So you can see me applying, uh, again, keeping in mind the light source, just a few little uh, streaks. I'm trying to, I thought with this one I'd try to keep it a little subtle. Sometimes I do like a bold line that goes across. Uh, certainly in cartoonier, kind of uh, more like chibi style illustrations, I will uh, go for quite a bold uh, approach to adding uh, highlights to the hair, but I'm going to experiment with uh, keeping it tasteful, <laughs> subtle, just little hints of uh, light glinting off the hair to make her hair appear shinier. And then the one other place where I would apply uh, highlights, I think, to this illustration would be uh, to the eyes, although, you know, the, I have left these areas of the eyes as the sort of the white of the page, but I do believe that applying a bit of white gouache can help that to uh, 
pop just a little bit more. Make those eyes look a little shinier. And there's this other uh, counter highlight over here that I thought would benefit from a touch of gouache. Um, maybe one last place where I would apply a bit of gouache is maybe on the um, strands of hair down here. Uh, if you only, especially with a character that has really long hair like this, if you only apply uh, highlight in one place, namely the uh, top part of the head, and it can look a little strange that, uh, or just unrealistic that light is not glinting off the hair in any other place. So yeah, but always um, want to be cautious about overdoing it. Very easy to overdo it with um, highlights and then you kill the the effect that you're going for. So anyway, I think that kind of does it um, for this illustration. Kind of does it? What are you talking about? If this illustration is not done, Krilly. It's not done until you add the blushies. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. Again, try to keep it subtle, tasteful. And uh, let me go ahead and grab my books. Always like to thank those who choose to support me by getting any of my books like Brody's Ghost and Miki Falls, my two graphic novel series, as well as Mastering Manga and Mastering Manga 2, and my newest book, The Realism Challenge, for those of you who want to learn the skills of hyper-realism. Very, very grateful to anyone who gets those books, but let's go ahead and lay down this pencil. I want to thank all of you for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed it, and I'll be back with another one real soon.